We're back on JB and Co. This time with special guest, Dr. Charles Boyd. Charles is a renowned plastic surgeon who has his own practice in the Ann Arbor area named Boyd Beauty. Thanks for spending time today with us, Charles. Hey, great to be here, Jared. Now, Charles, are you into sports at all? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I have to start off with the fact that I'm very <laughs> disappointed that my Bears <laughs> lost to your Lions last week. <laughs> It, it, it kills me, and it's like every time the Bears look like they're going to win, they do something to disappoint me at the end. So I, I, you know, that really hurt me. I have to say that. Well, I have to say I'm not disappointed in that, but you should, um, you should, you should at least be uh, take some homage in that we only win one or two games per year. So you should give us that. <laughs> the lion, the Lions, and the Bears are on the same boat. So, so that makes me feel a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> right. I have to say that the um, Matthew Stafford's wife used to work for me in my office. Okay. So, yeah. So I, you know, I have to definitely root for them. You have to, you have yeah. to. Oh, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> well, Charles, I read in one of your previous interviews that uh, your first job was at McDonald's. And while you were at McDonald's, you mentioned the fact that you learned a lot about customer service and efficiency. Um, how have you been able to use those qualities in your profession today? Yeah, you know, that was definitely my very first job. I think I was 14 years old. Uh, there are two things that were really unique about it. Um, first of all, it was a black owner of the store. So that kind of taught me early ownership and entrepreneurship. And there have been several mentors I've had in my life that have been actually in, have owned McDonald's. So that was, that was important. Uh, the second thing it taught me was really attention to detail. Mm -hmm. And so you think about, um, you know, it's fast food and it's all over and it's Americana, but it's really attention to detail is really what made them the franchise that they are. So that was things like um, you need to, you know, fold the bag two times. You need to do, you know, all these little precise things. So in fact, they have something called the McDonald's All-American Team, which is really like a contest that they have. So I was a member of that team. Okay. So early on, it taught me, you know, accuracy, precision, speed, and those things helped me, I think, throughout my life and my career. Mm -hmm. Well, that's awesome. And would you say there are any other qualities uh, from the time that you did work at McDonald's until now that you uh, accredit your success towards? Um, you mean specifically at McDonald's, I think it was, um, you know, I think I, I learned the early importance of management, leadership, um, accountability, all those things you, I think you earn by working, right? Just mm -hmm. having a job. And so those things, I think, help you throughout whatever you do. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said before, there were um, another mentor of mine um, was a good friend of my mother's who there were two brothers that owned seven McDonald's in Nashville, Tennessee. And so they were some of the pioneers in black ownership of McDonald's. And mm -hmm. so they taught me one of my most important lessons in life, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll digress to mention it for a minute. I was at lunch with uh, one of the brothers and I think I was in college at the time. And I told him I wanted to be a, a doctor. So anyway, he said to me, it's a great profession. You'll always be respected. You'll never be poor. So we were at lunch, he said, but I'm making money right now mm. while we're at lunch. He said, uh, he said, every morning when I wake up, I have a smile on my face because I'm wealthier than when I went to sleep at night. <laughs> and so that always stuck to me, you know, mm -hmm. because and so that was also kind of my drive for entrepreneurship and doing being able to do things that you can uh, do more passive income things. So that's also been something that's been important to me. Mm. I think that's great, uh, especially the fact that you said it was black ownership, black owned, right. and be able to learn from him uh, right. as a black man yourself to be able to take those right. and use them moving forward. I think that's awesome. Absolutely. Now, Charles, you had the opportunity to attend an HBCU. Uh, you received your undergraduate degree from Howard University in just three years, graduating summa cum laude. You then proceeded on to Harvard Medical School. And then after that, you went to business school at the University of Michigan. 
what would you say you enjoyed most about your academic endeavors? Wow, each one was um, so different and so unique. Um, yeah, you know, Howard was, um, you know, I, I say that, that that school made me who I am. So, so, you know, even in undergraduate, I was accepted into some Ivy League schools. And so I chose to go to Howard and, and it was important um, because I wanted that experience. It is very, it's very rarely that we get an experience where I'm gonna move from set. It's very rarely that we get an experience where um, you can be surrounded by other, you know, African Americans who are doing the same things that you're doing and want the same things and are interested in excellence and academics and success. Because you know, my high school was, you know, I was I don't know one of three African Americans in a high school. Yeah. You know, so even though I did well academically. Um, it, at times you're told that you're special, you're yeah. different than other people. And, you know, at Howard, you realize that you're not, you know, there were people that were from, you know, the roughest neighborhoods that were 10 times smarter than me. You know, there are people that had much more money and affluence and people from other co countries and cultures. And so that was super uh, important to me. We were also at the time when we were you know, very political, like anything that was going on came through Howard University. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of my good friends to this day is our vice president elect Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. So we were friends at Howard and have remained friends since then. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, I think a tremendous, um, like just learning, but not just academically, but also culturally. And the mm -hmm. other thing I think that uh, being at an HBCU for me, it was the first time that it really took color off the equation. So in school, you know, you know that at Howard, if you're not elected captain of the basketball team or you're, you know, the school board editor, mm -hmm. it's not because of your race, right? It's because of other things. So that's very liberating as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think that for me, I knew that once I got through Howard, then I was good anywhere else I went, I wanted to go. So yeah. when I got to Harvard, um, you know, some of my, many of my classmates, you know, they have, they had that imposter syndrome where you think that you're not good enough or they made a mistake. Mm -hmm. I never felt like that. You know, mm -hmm. I felt like I could compete with whomever I could, you know, I was ready to go. And um, same thing at University of Michigan, you know, by then, you know, I got through medical school and residency. And so then it's just, yeah. then, then you become, I think each time you become more focused in terms of what you are looking to receive out of your education. Mm -hmm. I think when you're starting out, it's more, you're just taking things in and then you're yeah. able to kind of pinpoint that down and, and kind of focus on the things that you need mm -hmm. to go forward. Yeah. I think what you said was powerful because when I, I, I look at your, the education that you received, um, I would look at uh, Harvard and say, uh, you know, that's probably the school, you know, one may be most afraid to attend because of academic prestige. Um, which you said Howard was because it put everything. So going up. Yeah. Yeah, there's no question. I think that, um, you know, it's like anything in life, you know, when you go through, when you go through something and you come out of it, then it just prepares you for the next thing. I, you know, for me in my life, I've always felt that everything I've done up until today will prepare me for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I've always said that, you know, tomorrow, you know, we may talk and I'm doing something completely different. You know, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm not doing medicine anymore, Jay. I'm doing something else. Yeah. And I've always felt good about that because, you know, I think that, you know, what what you all you do in your life is just preparing you for the next door, the next step. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So preparation and um, not being fearful of competition seems like something that I'm learning from you. Is there anything yeah. else? Uh, you would want to give advice to for young doctors or aspiring business owners um, as they come up in this world? Yeah, I would say embrace your failures, you know, because you will fail. You know, the, I think the, and I've got kids of my own, and I think the biggest uh, mistake um, 
that and my my kids are, are doing great and I'm so proud of them. And I have five daughters, so they're all like amazing, mm -hmm. smart, just phenomenal women. But yeah. I think that maybe the biggest mistake is not sharing enough of my failures. Mm. Because so often um, there's a one of my favorite quotes is by Maya Angelou that says, she says, haters only see your glory and they don't know your story. Mm. Right. So it's easy for people to see the shiny things and the success, but they really need to know the grit, yeah. the tears, mm -hmm. the work, you know, the blood. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Amen. Amen to that. Because because I know exactly what that's about. And and. I can share that with you because I know that you understand there's a lot of work that uh, is put in behind the scenes in order right. to be who you are today. So um, right. thank you for all the work that you've done. I appreciate that. Right. right. Now, can you talk a little bit about what sparked your interest in getting into plastic surgery? Yeah. Um, well, I always say a couple of things. I say that I'm, uh, I always say I get bored easily. And so, um, you know, it's always different, you know, so, there's never two noses or faces or ears or abdomens that are the same. So it's always a challenge to kind of do that. So it always requires excellence in your best. Um, you know, some of my closest friends live in New York. So you got your Brooklyn shirt on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, all my New Yorkers say, you know, in New York, you always have to have your A game on. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely true, I think, in medicine in general, because you, you're not allowed to make a mistake because you get sued, right? But but then even in plastic surgery, even more so because people are paying out of pocket and they want excellence and the best. So that always was important to me. Um, I'm a big art collector. And so that's one of the reasons I'm in New York today. And so there was that combination between science and art and plastic surgery. So that always, that's something else that drew me to this field. Um, there's a lot of technology and innovation and so all those things kind of were kind of my sweet spots. Mm -hmm. So I definitely love what I do. Um, most of my patients are happy. And, and fortunately for me, I get to see the, the happiness that I can provide like right then. So you get that immediate gratification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's so important. Um, you know, I've been doing like a medical mission trip um, on the not, you know, the other thing I do has been this medical mission trip to Kenya for about 20 years now, mm -hmm. actually since 2000. Uh, this year we didn't go because of COVID, but yeah. every year I've gone and just volunteer and, and we do generally between 80 to 120 babies mm -hmm. for about eight days of surgery. And so mm -hmm. that you also get that immediate gratification where you can hand the baby back to the mom and you see that joy and you know that you changed the life. Mm -hmm. And so all those things, just I always say I've got the best job in the world, you know, yeah. for me. Mm -hmm. so. That's beautiful. Uh, as we're talking about plastic surgery, I have to mention the fact that uh, I know that sometimes my mom watches the show called Botched. And uh, yeah. I, know, I know that patients come in on the show uh, because they may be unhappy with the work that they've got done uh, prior yeah. to coming there. Uh, so a question that I have for you as a plastic surgeon is, uh, I know that you work on individuals, face, body, and shape, um, but are there ever any pressures that stem from the fact of knowing the possibility that your customer may not be happy? And I know you just said that most yeah. of your customers are happy with the work that you've yeah. done. So uh, yeah. I just wanted to ask that. Yeah, I mean, I, that's always, you know, there's always that possibility. And, and, you know, one of the things that you learn is you try to figure that out before. Um, and so there are people that are just not going to be happy regardless because they think, you know, there's, there's some pure warning signs. Like they come in they're like, okay, well, you know, I think my, you know, my husband doesn't look at me. So if I get a facelift, all of a sudden he's going to pay attention to me. And I'm like, nah, that might, <laughs> that might not, <laughs> that might not be the way. Um, and so. You, I, I always say that half of what I do is psychology and the other half is surgery mm -hmm. because there's a lot of psychology and there's a lot of kind of understanding. I always say that um, I think my biggest gift or the, the, the thing that makes me successful is that I'm, I'm pretty empathic in that I kind of I need to know what you need and what you want, even if you don't. 
because that's what I have to provide you. So you might come in thinking you need one thing, but really you need something else. Mm -hmm. And that something else is really going to make you. And, and sometimes that means that you don't operate on people and you don't do procedures on people because it's not, it's just not worth it. Right. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, it's elective. So I can say no. Right. And be like, mm -hmm. yeah, I think you might need to find someone else because yeah. I can't provide that for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that uh, means a lot for you, for you to be able to say no uh, to a customer that may come in, um, understanding they may not be happy with that answer, but you're giving them the best answer for them because you know sure. what they're coming in for. And if they don't have good reasoning uh, for why they want to get uh, work done, then there's no reasoning and you guys get yeah. in that partnership. Yeah, it's a, and it is a partnership, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's this contract really to like, they, they are going to, provide you know you're providing a service to them and mm -hmm. so you i always say to them that the patient's goal and my goal are the same so we're aligned in the same yeah. way right and that's that they're happy at the end of the day mm -hmm. i say because if they're not happy i'm not going to be happy and mm -hmm. so we, that's it's a beautiful thing when it works mm -hmm. it's a terrible thing when it doesn't mm -hmm. so that's why you got to make sure you kind of make it work Exactly. Now, what steps do you take to customize your patients? So like if a patient were to come in and say, I want to look like Cardi B or I want to look like Kim Kardashian, how do you right. set expectations for those people? <laughs> well, you know, that that that's that conversation that we're talking about. And are those expectations realistic? Mm -hmm. You know, I had a patient that came in once and said, she said to me, she's an African-American woman. She said, I want my nose to look like Michael Jackson's. I said, <laughs> so I said, off the wall or this is it, you know? <laughs> and she was like, this is it. She's like, this is it. I was like, well, I'm not it. So I can't do that. <laughs> hey, I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, you know, it depends. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so, it has, you have to you have to give realistic expectations. Right? For sure, for sure. <laughs> now, for people who are fearful uh, about having work done, what would you say is the biggest misconception when it comes to plastic surgery? Uh, I think that um, that they're going to look different. They're not, they're not going to recognize themselves. They're they're going to be something that they're not. And I think that's in, especially. Um, with patients of color, you know, we, we are generally more skeptical many times of the medical field and, or you've seen like the Michael Jacksons or the, you know, little Kims of the world that don't look like they used to look. Yeah. And so they, there's an assumption that that's everybody, you know, people, you know, people often say to me, well, I can always tell when someone's had a plastic surgery. And my response to them is, I said, you can always tell when they've had bad plastic surgery, yeah. but if they've had good plastic surgery, they just look better, right? Mm -hmm. And that's always my goal. You should just be a better form of yourself, mm -hmm. of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And so you, you mentioned uh, a few celebrities just right there, Michael Jackson, Lil' Kim. I've always wondered personally, it, since we've noticed that they look completely different, is that just, that just means that they got bad work done because you, when you think about it they're, they're celebrities they had a lot of money so it's like how could they possibly have gotten messed up by somebody well i think it's it's like anything else right you can you can go overboard in anything right you can you can uh you know you can buy a new suit and think you're looking fly and then you add the hat and the cane and the gators and you might have gone too far you're mentioning Chicago, so I had to throw that in there. I like um, that. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's you know you know people with money. The one thing is true is I said you should you shouldn't be afraid to say no, but sometimes patients need to be told no too, mm -hmm. because there is this thing that's called body dysmorphic syndrome where patients literally they no longer see reality and they don't really know what looks good. So it's the same thing that makes people anorexic where they are 98 pounds but think they're overweight you know mm -hmm. because there's this disconnect between reality and that's when you know you have to be the doctor first right and yeah. say you need to this is a person who needs they need care and they need help and they need uh, a conversation and so I'm not afraid at all to tell people no but yeah. I don't think they're gonna I'm gonna help them or they need to seek something else mm -hmm. so it I think the 
the hardest thing really is many times we're talking about self-esteem. We're talking about things that don't have anything to do with our external being, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's what's inside. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I can fix that, you know, I try to fix that as well, but that's not rarely fixed with a knife. Yeah, for sure. Now, Charles, I do want to move on uh, slightly. Um, whenever I do research on my guests, uh, my favorite part about the research process is when I find out that they give back. And you touched on this uh, just a minute ago. Uh, you and your team of doctors uh, go to Kenya every single year, obviously not this year due to COVID, um, but you work with children by treating them with their cleft lips and their palates. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how your partnership with World Medical Missions has gone while you've been over there in Africa? Yeah, that was, um, you know, that started 20 years ago and it was, you know, almost when you, you know, when you slip and say something and someone calls you on it, that's mm -hmm. kind of how it started. Um, oh. I was on staff at University of Michigan at the time and one of our fellows, someone that was training under me said that he had gone on this trip last year and I mentioned, I said, oh, I've always wanted to do a trip like that, you know, to give back. And literally the next day, the person that led the trip called me and said, oh, so you want to go this year? <laughs> and I was like, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. so, uh, you know, that's one of those things. Be careful what you what you ask for. Got to be careful. Yeah. Right. Um, but it was truly a like a life changing experience. Um uh, First of all, I had been to Africa before, but I, you know, we were there two weeks at a time. The people were some of the most warm and happy and, and caring people. And over the years, um, you know, I've seen babies I've operate, then I've seen them as teenagers and as and having their own families. And that's been just an amazing experience. Um, I'll share one story. Um, there was a young man that worked in the recovery room. His name was Benson. So Benson, would, when we would finish operating, he was the one that would take the babies back to the mothers. And that's, that's the most satisfying moment there is. Usually I don't get to see that moment because you know we're just going operating kind of mm -hmm. nonstop. But Benson was just always happy, very just a joyful person. Um, and so one year he invited me to his home for dinner. Right, which is, you know, it's an honor. So, I, so we met at the hospital. We literally walked probably a half a mile through some cornfields. And we came to a row of what looked like a wooden shed. There was like six of them mm. that had a padlock. So he unlocked it and that was where he lived. Wow. And it was a kerosene lamp. Um, we had, he had a chair, he had some posters on the wall. And as I'm sitting in like the couch, I can literally hear the conversation of the shed next door because it's a, a wooden wall. Yeah. Wow. And so we had a meal and it was great. Um, and but what struck me was as I was leaving was this how happy he was as a person and his disposition and how in our country we have so much. Mm -hmm. And we're so happy, unhappy because we don't have the right watch or the right shoes or the right anything. And none of that really is what is about happiness, right? He didn't let his situation or his environment affect him. He was happy regardless where he was at. Absolutely. Yeah, I think and it just goes it just goes to the point where you're not you're not going to be happy with things, right? It's not mm -hmm. about the things in our life. Yeah. And I think people learn that as they continue to get older. Uh, but yeah. the quicker you learn it, um, the better your life will probably be. Yeah. Now, you talked, of, you talked about this earlier as well, too. Vice President-elect Kamala Harris is a former Howard classmate of yours and a longtime yeah. friend. The moment she was elected the first woman and woman of color to vice president, what did it mean for you, for Howard, for women, and for people of color as a whole? Yeah, I think it's I think it's amazing. You know, I was I was supporting her when she was running for president. Um, she's always been one of these people that is just genuine, just brilliant, hardworking, um, and always wanting to do the right thing. 
Mm -hmm. um, it was super interesting um, just in some ways watching from the outside in when you know someone and you hear the pundits and you hear the all the noise that's around like like is she black is she this is she frost you know all these things that um like when she was on campus she was any other student on campus yeah. and that's and so i'm i'm so happy and I, i'm happy because like I, like most people don't even know what's to come and so she's just i think brilliant and is going to do the right thing for the right reason to help everybody so mm -hmm. i was super happy you know for howard you know howard people like if you if you talk to anybody that went to howard you know howard people would be like but of course you know that's what that's <laughs> you know that's what you would expect um yeah. so um so i think it's great i think it's like i said i think it's great for hbcus in general um I encourage HBCUs aren't for everybody, but I think everyone should go to an HBCU that's in college, at least for a semester. Mm. Because as I said, it, it puts you in a very unique environment in the United States, mm -hmm. right? It's very few places where you are not the minority or one of a few. Mm -hmm. And that's such a liberating thing to do. You know, it doesn't, you know, I'm on the board of trustees at Howard, and so we don't have the don't have the resources and the endowment sometimes of the Harvards or the Michigans or the bigger schools. But that environment and those 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 grounds that have nurtured so many leaders in our community and lawyers and PhDs and scientists and artists is just amazing. So it's a I think it's a truly special place. Yeah. And I didn't attend an HBCU, but my older sister did. She went to North Carolina A&T. And uh, I just remember dropping her off at college. And I was a younger kid. And I just, you know, there was something about it. It was like once you stepped yeah. on campus, on campus, you, you felt something different. And it's hard for me to explain, but you probably know what I'm talking about. And right. it, it, it makes me feel like I missed out, which I, I probably did. But it's something that... Um, you know, I'm happy for my sister that she had the opportunity yeah. to experience that. And I'm happy that I had the opportunity uh, to go to a few home homecomings and, 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 and spend some weekends there. <laughs> right, right. Well, you got right. I didn't even mention homecoming. That's a whole other thing, right? And that's a whole other story. I already know. <laughs> um, and back to Kamala Harris, uh, I thought I read somewhere that you said if you get in a, a debate with her, you can forget about it. She's she's going to kill you in a debate. Is that is that true? Right. Yeah, yeah, always. She was on the debate team at Howard. Fortunately, we weren't debating too many things, which was good. Um, but just a, um, just, I mean, super kind and super, uh, just smart. And I think that, um, you know, obviously, I think some of the, some of the people that have testified in the Senate hearings have realized that too, that they don't want to, they don't want to face her questions. But, um, but yeah, I think that she's just great great for the country and one thing that you look forward to most when she does take off uh you know i think i i look forward to um you know hopefully like putting our world back again i know 2020 has been this like it's like bizarro land and everything is different seemingly overnight um but you know even as a physician you know i look forward to the time when like medicine and science is not political. Mm -hmm. Like that's, you know, if you traditionally, if you looked at some of the most trusted people in the country, like if you were doing TV or news or radio, it was always physicians, right? People could believe their physician because they're looking out for their health. Mm -hmm. And now that's changed, right? Where yeah. people don't even believe, you know, I'm like, if you have cancer, it doesn't matter what your political affiliation is, right? Exactly. You need it and you I need to treat it and or do things to prevent it. Mm -hmm. So, and I yeah. couldn't agree with you more. I think uh, this year we've seen politics get in the way of more things than ever before. So, yeah, you definitely make a great point. Charles, now we'll dive into our last segment, which I call on the personal side, in which I'll ask you five questions. So that way my audience and I can get to know you just a little bit better before you go. Sure. Uh, who's your mentor? And in a few words, how have they helped you? Uh, I would say my, I've had so many, I would say my longest, my, my mentor has to be my mother. You know, she's, uh, she's been, you know, my rock. She's a, she was, 
you know, she's a PhD in psychology. So she was the first black woman to get a PhD out of Ole Miss, University of Mississippi. Wow. Um, my, my parents had divorced at that time. So she was raising me at the same time and just, you know, and even when I first started my office in 2009, I kind of drug her out of retirement to be my office manager, which she did that too. So I would have to, I would have to give big ups to her on that. That's what mothers are so for. Definitely mother. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a book you recommend and why? Hmm. Uh, I would say the book everyone should read is Cast hmm. right now. Um, that is uh, just a, an, uh, it's an amazing book that just talks about kind of where we are in, in this country and it, it deals with race and, and poverty and there's so much that has to do with um, just how we see each other and you know it kind of also gets into that whole you know our system is really based on what we have and there's always trying to put someone on top of someone else mm -hmm. as opposed to not you know, and I think that's even when you talk about this equal justice and things um, that we've been going through, you know, all people really want all, you know, certainly I want is just level that playing field and then yeah. let me compete. Exactly. So. I like that. I like that. If you were given the chance to go back in time, what would you do differently? Mm. Um, I may have stayed at Howard a little bit longer. You know, I graduated in three years. I don't think I would have done, I definitely wouldn't have done that. You know, I wouldn't have rushed to get out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, I'll finish and go on to med school. And I would have like slowed down a little bit. Yeah. You know, okay. be like, what's the rush? Yeah, I like it. I like it. And what would you say the greatest business decision that helped you propel your career forward? Um. It was just starting my own business. You kind of leaving the comforts of working for someone else. You know, I was working for the University of Michigan, and then, um, and even though I was moving up on this, I was doing things. It was, you know, being able to, as they say, eat what you kill. Like it's, it's a very, uh, it's very scary. It's probably the most stressful time because at the time I had you know, five young children, I was the only breadwinner. And so it's, you know, you have to make it right. So mm -hmm. failure is not an option. Mm -hmm. So when you're faced with that situation, there's nothing you can do but be successful. But it was definitely the best decision in my life. Mm -hmm. And just to piggyback off of that, there's a, a lot of people who are afraid to break loose, even though mm -hmm. breaking loose is probably what's best for them. Is there any yeah. advice that you can give them? Yeah, you just have to, um, you know, you have to take the risk and you have to, um, you know, at times it's like, you give you a bad basketball analogy, but mm -hmm. you should be close to you, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, are you going to be on the sideline? You're going to be a fan or you're going to be a player, right? And mm -hmm. so if you're, everybody on the, in the stands thinks they can do anything, but step on the court. So you got to be on the court to, to exactly. score. Perfect. And finally, what thoughts can you leave us with to overcome the challenges of 2020? Uh, I would just say, you know, stay prayerful, stay hopeful, and just know, you know, I always say that at times, at my darkest times, right, there have been days when everything is not going well at all. But the only the thing I tell myself is, well, tomorrow has got to be better. Yeah. Right. So 2021 has got to be better than 2020. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Tough times don't last, but tough people do. There you go. There Stephen Covey. Exactly. All right. Well, that concludes this episode of JB and Co. Charles, uh, with Charles Boyd. Uh, we appreciate you joining us and allowing us to get to know you a little bit better. Thanks for coming on today. All right. Thank you, brother. All right. Have a great one. You too. Take care.